All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, ready to get started. So this is uh, a pretty good turnout. This is uh, a little better than I was expecting for a talk where I'm not going to actually show you any code or anything new at the end of the second day of the conference. If I knew it was going to be uh, this good, I wouldn't have bribed all of my coworkers to show up. But you know, thank you very much for, for coming. Um, so this is Life in App Engine production for Google I.O. Uh, 2011. And uh, you've got some hashtags up here suggested if you want to Twitter during the, during the talk. And we've got a very convenient and memorable feedback URL that you can visit if you'd like to give us feedback during the talk or after. And we'd very much appreciate if you do that. Um, so I'm ready, so let's get started. So uh, who am I? I'm Michael Handler. I'll be your cruise director for this talk. I'm the tech lead for the App Engine SRE team. I'm based out of San Francisco. Uh, I'll be co-presenting with, uh, with my first mate, Alan Green, also from the uh, App Engine SRE team. He's based out of the Sydney office, and we've got the hashtags and the feedback URL up there again, uh, you know, just, you know, just in case you missed it in the last five minutes. Um, so everybody says we should have a table of contents. So I'm going to get through this as quickly as I can. So who am I? What do I do? What do I do all day? How does that affect App Engine? What has happened to App Engine that we expected? What's happened to App Engine that we didn't expect? What do we do to make App Engine more reliable when those things happen to us, both the stuff we expected and the stuff we didn't expect? And based on all of that, if you're building a production system on App Engine or offside of App Engine, what can you do to make your, App Engine, um, your application more reliable? And then we've got a demo of some monitoring technology that we're really happy about and that we're entering Trusted Tester with. So I've said SRE twice, and I haven't defined it, so I should probably fix that. So SRE is Site Reliability Engineer. So this is a program that started in Google uh, you know, some number of years ago. And here you can see uh, our mascot with our logo on it. Uh, we are concerned with the lack of downtime, or rather, uptime. So Google Site Reliability Engineering. So we have a very simple mission, which is Google products need to be fast. They need to be available. Whenever you put Google.com into your browser, whenever your website requests you know, content ads or whatever, that has to happen. It has to happen all the time, 24 hours a day. Uh, 365 days a year, or 366, just like that, as fast as possible so that the users are happy. Um, so what we end up doing doesn't show up in uh, new product releases, new SDKs, change lists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the work that we do is invisible. And we wanted to say, we want to get out there and let people know that Google has SRE teams, because we want people to know that we exist, because we do. Um, and to, for you to understand the kind of work that we're doing, both for you uh, on App Engine and for all other Google products. So what happens when Google products launch is that the developers run them. So they're spending all of their time getting the product stable and directing traffic to it and saying, OK, let's encourage people to use it. Let's get out there and advocate for it. And then it gets a certain level of stability and a certain level of growth. And we're saying, OK, wow, people actually like this product and want to use it. And the uh, developers are splitting their time between, well, let's make the product is, uh, as stable as we can while growing it and also adding these new features. And it just doesn't end up working out really well that we found. It's better if you can let people focus on adding new features and let other people specialize on uh, making it stable for the existing users and enabling growth. And this is where the SREs come in. So we originally had SRE teams docketed to search and ads, the, you know, the original core Google products that tells you how long ago, how old this program goes back, because you know, the, search, the search developers and the ads developers needed to spend all of their time adding the features, and they had lost scope of all the things that we needed to do to deal with the volume of Google search queries that were coming in every day. So we're talking about App Engine reliability. And the SRE team, we're the, people that, you know, we're the people that do that. So you may sort of think, well, what does that day look like for us? Well, we're sitting around, and then the alarm goes off, and we go, oh my god, something's wrong. We all pile out, we fix the problem, put the fire out. Everybody's back and happy and doing what they're doing. And we go back into the firehouse, and we sit around, play cards, do it, you know, and wait until well, you know, the, the alarm goes off again. So if you've been on App Engine for a long time, and you know, there were, we had some instability problems in the past, you might think a little differently of us. You might say, like, wow, there's a reliability team. They should take off their clown noses, and they should you know, get back to work, right? But the reality of this is actually a little different, which is to say that you know, we're technical professionals, we're engineers, and we look at this from an engineering perspective. We certainly respond in, with, at priority when there's a problem, but what we need to do 
in addition to fixing it, is make sure that it doesn't happen again. It's not just enough to do crisis response. You actually have to do full engineering to understand the problems, to understand what's going on. What we end up spending most of our time doing is managing complexity. Uh, we've, you know, you've all designed and architected systems, and you've put diagrams up there, and they're beautiful and simple, and you go, wow, this is fantastic, it's gonna work. And that diagram never survives first contact with the enemy. And that's even more true at Google than it is you know, outside at smaller scale. So all of these things, you know, your, your perfect plan gets overridden by reality. So where does that complexity come from? Well, we all run on computers, and we all know that computers are very reliable things that never do anything that are, is at all mysterious or that you don't expect. Um, and you know, when, when they're, uh, and that's, you know, that might actually be slightly true when they're, you know, standing alone, but they, we, live them, we put them in data centers, and they're all inter interconnected between each other. And a computer that was having a great time just sort of doing its thing, uh, now it's getting bothered by its neighbor down the row, and it's not as reliable as it used to be. It's asking it to do things, crazy things are happening, traffic patterns are going on. That's, it's just confusing. Um, and then we make the situation worse because we've got data centers everywhere all around the world, and they're all interconnected at high speed, and this means that you know, no, now, now can your nice, reliable computer be bothered by a computer near it, it can be bothered by a computer halfway around the world. Um, and this is even before we've got the, the uh, oh, we've got the infrastructure, the support infrastructure, that if you've built this global network of applications, servers, data centers, and all of these other things, you need a bunch of support infrastructure. I'm gonna touch on exactly what that looks like in a little bit. And then, right, you've got the traffic coming from the users. More traffic than you could ever expect, uh, that you could ever deal with, uh, that you've you ever thought that you would deal with. And it comes every day without fail, you know, with peaks and valleys, and you just, you have to be ready, you know, Whatever you happen to you today at peak traffic, if you started having problems, you're going to happen, it's going to happen to you just as badly tomorrow, and you need to be ready to deal with it. And we even haven't gotten into the circumstances of random chance. We have a lot of computers, we have a lot of data centers, we have a lot of complicated systems. They all interact with each other, and each one of those systems every day is a chance for the universe to roll the dice and say, maybe something weird is going to happen to you. So, you have to be ready for these, for these kinds of things as well. So I had a very simple balancing act over here. So we've got stability on one side, and over here we've got, uh, we've got the new features that the developers are carefully stacking on, and we'll just balance this out. And it's not that simple. It's not that simple on the reliability side at all. So this is a quote from Leslie Lamport, a computer scientist who invented the Paxos distributed consensus algorithm. We use this inside App Engine on the high replication data store. A distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. And that's more or less a description of my day every day, um, which is to say that there are, you know, we've got a, you know, the Rumsfeld reference up here, there are unknown unknowns. I come to work and something weird has happened. It might be from a computer I've heard of, it might not. And if it's one I've heard of, I probably know what to do. If, you know, if it's one I don't know what to, if it's one I've never heard of before, I need to figure out quickly, restore everything to service, and then, you know, go on making sure that that doesn't happen again. So we're talking about life in production, and that's the Google production environment, and what does that look like? And you know, where can I get one of these fantastic hard hats and ear protection for my day-to-day -day job? Um, so App Engine's a cloud computing environment, uh, you, know, you all know this, and Google has a cloud computing environment. We don't have a dedicated data center for App Engine. We don't have a dedicated set of machines for App Engine. We run App Engine inside the same cloud computing environment that Google does. Um, and so there's all of these layers of infrastructure inside Google's cloud computing environment. You've got, you've got the environment itself, you've got lock services, storage services, monitoring, configuration and reporting, binary packages, and there's like, I ran out of space before I could list all of the ones that I thought were really important. I know, right, there are computers and they need power, networking, and cooling if they're going to operate, if they're going to be at all useful to us. Um, so it's interesting that uh, we find ourselves somewhat in the same situation uh, that our customers do in terms of running App Engine. So you come to us and say, well, we want you to run this application for us. And we say, that's fantastic. We'll totally do that. Um, but we don't run all of that, all of those things that I just mentioned ourselves. We can't. There's not enough of us. And the, the specialization that would be, that would be required for us to run every part of that infrastructure all the way down to the computers would be astronomical. We would need a huge team of people, and we probably would, wouldn't be consistently good at running all parts of it. So in the same way that you depend on us, we depend on further down the stack, a bunch of people, a bunch of SREs running the storage services, the lock service, the, the cloud computing environment, all the way down to data centers and hardware ops uh, who keep on running you know, the machines. Now, 
we can't operate with them on a handshake basis in the same way that we can't operate with you on a handshake basis. Uh, you know, we, there have been some discussion about the changes in app, in, app engine pricing model. We're charging, you know, we're, 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 we're changing the pricing model. It might be a little more expensive for people. We're saying, we're asking this money of you because we're offering a certain amount of reliability. And in the same way, I can't just say, well, I depend on that infrastructure, uh, but you know, you guys are going to mostly run it for us, right? Um, because they understand the infrastructure and they can look at it and say, it's got this much complexity, it's got, we've got our own dependencies, and we think it can be available this much amount of the time, this many nines, or this, you know, this much downtime per year. And we look at what they offer us and say, we can work with that, we'll use your service. Or if it's below our threshold, we say, you know what, we'd love to use it if you could bring it up to this level of reliability. Can we pay you, you know, in internal currency or favors or whatever it is? And say, like, you know, and they, sometimes they say yes and sometimes they say no. Um, and the reason that this is important is that mathematically we're depending on all of these services. And you cannot be more reliable than the least reliable service that you rely upon. So we have to make a decision based on the reliability of the underlying services that we rely upon. And so what's some of the sources of this unreliability? Well, the software is not static. It's always changing. There's always bugs being found. There's always features being added. Um, we're also always you know, worried about, effic about efficiency and increasing efficiency. Uh, we have, you know, our computers. If we can make a change across the board that brings 5% efficiency improvement in this subsystem across all of Google, that's a lot of spare computing cycles. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of all, that's a lot of money that we can save, that we can use to, you know, use the same infrastructure to scale everything else. Um, so this is software, and it needs to be upgraded, but we don't want to be, you know, it doesn't, can't be like, you know, your laptop where it says, well, I want to install this software, hold on while I reboot. Um, so we have to get this software out there into the production while, while uh, you know, not, you know, still, so, while still having 24 by 7 service for all of these Google applications. So, we designed from the beginning for in-place updates transparently as possible, which is to say that there's an update going on right now in the background. We're slowly, you know, rolling it out. And you shouldn't notice anything except that, like, you know, Gmail, all of a sudden you, you know, your Gmail's chugging along, and then it says, oh, wait, I need to reload, and you get your mailbox back again, and the UI's a little different. It wasn't like Gmail was like, we're going to be down for six hours while we're doing an upgrade. We do this upgrade in place right up until the moment that we expose it to you. The infrastructure underlying it works the same way. When there's a new version of the storage subsystem, we just say, roll it out slowly in the background, slowly enough that, you know, that, the, uh, that the services that are using on it are engineered to deal with that unreliability. But you can't do this with everything, because some maintenance is too intrusive. Sometimes it requires you know, intrusive software work. You actually have to take down part of the stack, rework it a little bit, bring it back up. Similarly, if they say, well, we want to take down half the data center to rework the power distribution units, fix the generator, uh, oh wait, the cooling's having problems. We can't, you can't just say like, you know, we're gonna do this and, you know, hopefully everything will be all right. Um, so what we do is we get out our calendar and we mark out and we say, okay, this given data center, um, we need to do a bunch of work on it and we do this on a regular schedule and we're gonna gang up all of the really intrusive, you know, disruptive work that we need to do, put it all together and say, this data center is gonna be out during this time period. Um, and there's an interesting design pattern here, which is to say that we don't say that every data center, you know, we're, is, we're gonna try and keep it up as much as possible all of the time. We, you know, when you start launching a product at Google, you understand that the data center that you land in is going to blink out of existence for some amount of time every year. And what that means is that you have to be nimble. You have to be able to say, okay, when that happens, I need to be able to serve my user capacity somewhere else. I need to do it as transparently as possible. This has to be baked into your application from the beginning, or you're going to take embarrassing outages every time this happens. So speaking of, uh, <laughs> speaking of architecting for, uh, for data center failovers, how does this apply to App Engine, specifically the master-slave configuration that we launched in? So we, I've seen this uh, you know, talk, uh, I've seen this slide given a couple other times, so I'm gonna sort of blaze through it a tiny bit. But so this is a very complicated app, app engine architectural diagram that, you know, our intellectual property that I'm revealing to you here for the price of admission, um, which is that your application is serving out of data center A, and reads and writes are happening to the data store, and everything's great, and we are asynchronously replicating from the data store in A to the data store over in B. Um, and uh, so everything's sort of well and good, and then they say, hey, data center A is gonna be unavailable for time period X. And we pick a time a little advanced of time period X, and if you're, you've launched an application on master slave, this should be sort of familiar to you, what, what's going on. But I'll show you under the covers. Um, so we disable writes, 
and so that you can continue reading, but there's no changes coming into the data store. And this is so that we can engage this bulk data copy process, synchronizing data center A and data center B's data store. And once that's done, we are guaranteed that A and B are identical. We can say, all right, we're ready to go, and we flip the switch, and we move、uh, data center B to be the master. Reads and writes are happening there. The direction of replication is reversed. And at this point, we can take data center A offline for some amount of time, and you know, we can, they can do whatever they need to it with the power and the cooling and the hey, hey, hey. And you know, your application continues to serve, other than the fact that, you know, with no further outage, other than the read only period that we just made you, made you go through. So that's all well and good, but it's also not very complicated. If, they, if this was all that we had to deal with, they wouldn't need SREs, and I wouldn't have this job, this very interesting and well paying job. So I want to talk a little bit about things that happened to us that we sort of didn't anticipate.、Um, and, you know, I. There's a bunch of good stories here, and I really wish I could tell. And, and, and a lot of them I was like, how about this one?、And、they said,、mm, no, no, that, that exposes a little too much of our infrastructure. This is what I could get cleared, and、uh, it's, oh, they're so good.、Um, all right, so we exposed、uh, a long time ago uh, that uh, Google doesn't have UPSs in our data centers. We have,、uh, you know, have, you know, a big room full of batteries. Each server has a small UPS battery next to it. Connected to it, providing battery backup in case the power goes out.、Um, and so, you know, here's a, store, here's a server, simplified, that is running the storage process. And it's accepting writes from the service, it's accepting writes from the network and committing them to disk, and it's all really good. But you note that it's,、um, the storage process is talking to a power management process. And you say, sort of, well, well why is that?、Um, it's so that we can do this, which is an amazing optimization, and I really, really like it,、um, which is to say that if the power goes out,、uh, we're running off of battery. And, Rather than doing some kind of broadcast notification from a central location that, oh, hey, the data center has lost power, the server knows that as soon as it's happened, that the power is off because it's running off a battery. The wall power has gone away.、Um, and the great thing that can happen is that the storage process asks the power management process. It says, hey, you know, it's doing this periodically, and it's saying, what's the state of the power infrastructure? And you say, well, you know, why would it bother?、And、so it can do this, which is、um, when the power is out, it'll say, oh, wow. I shouldn't accept any more writes from the network. And the reason it does that is because we've accepted writes and they're maybe cached in memory. They may be you know, in, the, in the application memory. They may be in the kernel memory. They may be in write cache on the disk. You know, the write has not necessarily been synchronously accepted from the network all the way down to the disk. So we want to buy ourselves some time to get that flush to happen, which if this server is going to lose power, then we want to you know, have a guarantee that we have a high, or a high guaranteed chance that the data was all committed. So, the storage process says, I'm not going to accept any other writes. And this works beautifully. So, imagine you have a data center that looks like this with an array of storage nodes.、Um, and, you know, writes are happening everywhere. A couple of the servers are down for maintenance, so they're denying writes and everything's happy. And then the power goes out. And it looks like this. And it's just, it's, you know, it's beautiful. Everybody says, I'm not accepting writes. And as quickly as that happens, all of the services that we're trying to write to them realize, wow, nothing here in this data center is accepting writes. Let me return. A deferral back to the client JavaScript that's running in the user's browser. And they say, hey, we're having a, a problem. Let's try again in a minute. So the state that the user is trying to submit isn't lost. We didn't say, oh, yeah, we accepted it and you know, it's, all, it's all good. We can you know, ripple that. We, we, the, the minute this happens, we can ripple that error back out to the user in,、uh, in a way that allows them to cleanly retry. It's beautiful. And of course, I'm telling you this story is because it didn't work out that way,、um, which is to say that.、Uh, The power management process is talking to the power supply. Power supplies are spooky, spooky analog crap. And occasionally, the power management process would talk to the battery,、uh, or talk to the power supply, and say, So, hey, how's the battery? And the power supply would say, There's no battery attached to me. <laughs> really? Okay.、Um, you know, I thought I just asked you a minute ago and you said there was, but maybe, maybe they disconnected it. Okay, that's fine. And then if you asked it again a minute later, it would say, oh, oh right, no, sorry, there's a battery and here's its sort of like, you know, voltage and charge and, and general health.、Um, but there was a race condition in the middle here where the storage process would、uh, ask the power management process, so what's the state of the power? And the power management process would say,、uh, it's good, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, we're up, we clearly have power, but I don't have a battery installed, just so you know. And the power managed storage process made a decision that was not actually very good, which is it decided, well, if there's no battery, I don't need to keep on talking to you anymore. That thread that I was running that was talking to the、uh, power, power managed process, I'm going to save some CPU by,、uh, by just shutting that down. Because there's no point. If there's no battery, when the, when the power goes out, I'm just going to crash. Why should I bother? 
And you can sort of, uh, you can think about the consequences of this, which is to say that the power goes out and the server keeps on going, you know, yep, sure, I'll take some writes, you do whatever you want, you know, I'll, I'll take them into, you know, into, uh, in, in, and, you know, continually hold them in memory. And then we had a, a power outage uh, that looked like this, um, which is to say that, you know, most of the servers uh, accepted, you know, said, oh, wait, I don't, you know, I'm not going to accept any, any writes, but a handful of them had triggered this bug. And when they triggered this bug, they said, they continued accepting writes. And so this was fine because, well, okay, we went, on to, um, uh, we went on to the generator, and that was great. And the generator came back, and I have another slide of all green, and, you know, it's all fantastic. And then, um, then the generator's turbos started glowing cherry red, and um, the hardware ops guys on site said, well, you know, I don't know what the procedure is for this, but it looks like it's about to explode. And when it's about to explode, I think we're going to turn it off. So they went over and they hit the big red button, and they really have a big red button for this, and you know, I'm glad they got to hit it at least once. And they turned the generator off, so we're back on battery again. And the utility power hasn't come back on, so we're in this situation, and all of these servers are accepting writes and accepting writes and accepting writes, and then they all crash. And yeah. So that didn't really sort of work out so well for us. Um, I I'm gonna point out that we didn't have any data loss in this situation, because when the power went out, we drained the data center of traffic. We have the ability to globally redirect traffic away from that data center. We said, okay, something's going on, so user traffic went away. But there were still some background processes running, doing you know, batch processing of various stuff. And when those things, uh, those things were still running, even though the front-end traffic had gone away, and so these, you know, they were happily writing and happily writing and happily writing, and then we lost that data uh, temporarily when the servers crashed. When they came, this, this uh, drastically increased our return to service time for this data center, right? It, it, it took it out for much longer than statistically it takes us to return a data center to, out, to service after we've had a power outage. That's no good for us, so, you know, we fixed that. Um, so we learned some things from this, which is that you can't always trust your monitoring. Um, it'll lie to you, and sometimes it'll lie to you intermittently, which is awesome. Um, you know, and, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, this is a, a trust but verify, you know, Ron, Ronald Reagan's, you know, excellent one, one quote. Um, and say that don't make any decisions permanently based on one data point, right? You know, and, you know, the, the, like I said, the system may lie to you. And some optimizations are not worth doing. It, you know, it was very nice of the storage process to say, I'm going to save you this fractional amount of CPU by not running this query to the, uh, um, you know, to the power management process, but, it cost us all of this time in cleanup and debugging and you know general frustration afterwards. So you know this is a this is a good lesson for there. Um, so I've got a quote here uh, from Clay Cavaness, who runs Google's Mac Ops organization. This is these numbers in here are about uh, our laptops fleet. They don't tell you anything about our production data centers. I'm not disclosing anything that has not been uh, that has been tightly held before. Um, a large fleet like ours means that a bug that crops up only 0.5% of the time affects over 100 people. It becomes difficult to file bugs when the how to reproduce section is do this 25,000 times. And I tell you this story because uh, the next story is really sort of all about that. Um, so one day somebody's pager goes off and it says um, uh, the big table, uh, a big table, not the entire big table, but a table inside a big table is gone. And he comes up and says, well, you know, online and says, well, what's going on? We're serving errors out of this application now. Um, and he looks at the, why did this go away? Uh, and he looks at the big table master and he says, oh, okay, it says that, you know, there was an RPC to delete that table from this server and this user at this time. And they went back and looked at that server, um, and that server had recently, there was a process that had run on that, uh, by that user on that server, and it had a stack trace, and it said, function A, function B, function C, destroy table. And I went, huh. And it was funny, because if you looked at the code for function C, it never should have called destroy table. So at this point, we're going, okay, you know, what's going on? Is this enemy action, or, you know, what, what, what the hell? Um, so this was a, a language with virtual method dispatch, unfortunately. Um, and we pulled that server out of, uh, out of commission, and we put it in through the equivalent of Google Memtest x86. And, you know, we, after long enough, we found out that, oh, hey, if you, you know, let it run long enough under high enough load, it starts corrupting contents of memory occasionally. And as near as we can tell, what happened here was there was an, in function C, there was an index into, you know, whatever t function it was going to call, give big table a hug or something. And, um, you know, and, and, and the processor uh, corrupted in memory just perfectly to say, instead of calling uh, that function, let's call destroy table instead. 
And again, this was no data loss here, because after a big table is deleted, it's not instantaneously garbage collected. We have some services, we have you know, facilities where we can go, OK, let's recreate it at the state of the last, you know, right before the deletion. Um, on the other hand, that's not acceptable to us, because the minute that this happened, we started serving errors out of that data center for that product, right? So that, you know, you know, we're serving 500s or whatever the error code was, or please try again later, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, <sighs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's good times. It's really good times. Um, so what do we learn about this is that, uh, again, trust but verify. I have seen every piece of hardware at Google attempt to corrupt data. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm almost, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost not kidding. Uh, processors, memory, hard drives, power supplies, uh, network switches, network cables. I have not heard a story where um, the dolly that we use to move machines around or a bad power cable has corrupted data, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody came to me and told me a story where that had happened. Like, if you, when you have enough pieces of hardware, they, they're out to get you. I don't believe that there are bad people, but I believe that there is actually bad hardware. I, I you know, and, and um, do you need checksums? You need checksums on data transmission, checksums for data at rest, and, and verify them. Because you know, if you transmit the data and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't comes out at the other end, it's not what you expected, somewhere in there is somewhere in something in there, there's a there's a bad piece of hardware. And you need to find it and get it out of your infrastructure as quickly as possible because it's causing, unless you're, you know, you maybe causing data loss and potential data loss, something that you're going to have to recover. Find these things and get rid of them. They are the bad apples. Um, and you know when these things happen, you have to you you can't be sure that you know that's like I said that story. That suddenly a big table was gone and nobody copped to having done it. And you know were we, were we hacked? Was you know was some disgruntled employee just going it? No. This is the uh, the evidence that you know if you give an infinite number of monkeys a typewriter, you know one of them will write Shakespeare. If you put enough pieces of Google hardware and you roll enough dice over days and days and days, eventually one of them will spontaneously attempt to delete your data out from under you. So I've told you some stories about uh, planned maintenance and unplanned maintenance, and you know what, what, what we learn here is that any given data center can blink out of existence, you know, or, or be rendered unfit for serving. It doesn't matter that the data center was still there when we deleted that big table, because at the minute that that happened, um, we started serving errors. For it was this wasn't App Engine, this was a different product, um, and you need to be able to deal with that. And there's a, there's an unending like list of things, right? I mean, we haven't even gotten into like people stealing fiber optic cable or people digging up accidentally, you know, trenching up fiber optic cable, which is you know the, the bane of any you know networking company's existence. Um, and you can attempt to harden each site to make them resilient against these things, but it doesn't always work, right? It doesn't matter how many like how many uh, er how much error correcting RAM I had in that machine if the processor was doing the corruption. Um, it doesn't matter if how many generators I had if, you know, that if, you know, if, if we, you know, we roll the dice and eventually the data spontaneously gets deleted, right? Situations will arise that will just, that will, that will make a mockery of it. It's like the Maginot line. You're just going to, like, they're just going to go around it. And you're going to be like, oh, well, now I have to deal with this. So architecturally, um, what have we learned about App Engine and making it more reliant and making it more reliable? Um, and so, you know, philosophically, we found that you know people through the ages have uh, sort of like have the have the right sort of instinct uh, for this kind of thing that we like to find in SRE. Um, so here's again the master-slave data store, and I'm not going to go through a bunch of failure slides, but we can just talk about it a little bit, which is to say that, you know, imagine this circumstance: data center A can go away at any time, the power can go out, and you know we can't get and we can't get it back on in time. Uh, you know the data. The the one of the data. The the big tables that we're relying upon can get spontaneously deleted, and we can restore it. But again, that's going to take some amount of time. Um, if there could be a network partition that just takes the data center off the map, and all of these things conspire to say that okay, well, we can't serve your application out of here. We need to move it. But unfortunately, there's this little like line marked asynchronous replication on there that makes it hard for us because we've committed certain amounts of data to the data store in A, and if we promote B, that data is not there. And it's not lost because the data center is going to come back, and we're going to be able to move it, um, move it back over. But in the meantime, if we promote your B to be serving, all of a sudden your application has jumped backwards in time a couple of minutes for all of the writes. And once we do get data center A back online, we say, okay, here's the uncommitted data. Um, I can't say to you just like, oh, well, we'll just like shove it into the data center B, because you may have rewritten that data, you may have deleted it, whatever. We have to say, here's your data. You can decide what to do with it, 
and we're going away. That's not a good story for you. Where that's, that's, that's the kind of thing that we're trying to hide from you, and that's not a good story for us. We don't want to spend our time doing that either. There's way more interesting problems uh, to be solving for us. Um, and like I said, you, know, you can decide that, okay, we, what we should do is armor the sites. And when we do, when we find things that, we find some kinds of fragility that we think we can sort of make less common. You know, we'll, 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 we looked at that and we said, all right, we can deal with this kind of thing. Um, but you can't anticipate everything. And really what we found, on, found out is that you need to become agile. You need to be able to leap around. Things are going to come at you like, you know, like you know, your Jackie Chan movie. Things are going to be coming at you from all directions, above, behind. You know, things are, things are going to try and fall on you. And the best thing you can do is be able to move quickly so that you can deal with, you know, you know, while you see that coming at you, get out of the way, then figure out what you do next. And so we thought about this for a while, and we looked at sort of the things that improved inside Google infrastructure, and we said, what can we do about this? And the end product is this. It's the high replication data store configuration to App Engine. Um, and what it is is we run, uh, we, you know, we run multiple data centers, and you know, three is not the actual number, uh, and we serve your application out of one of them, but all of your writes happen synchronously to all of them, before we, or to a majority of them, using the Paxos algorithm, which we talked about in the data store talk and also Leslie Lamport's paper. And so we, have, we commit your rights to a majority of them before we return success to you, your application, before you return success to the user in the web browser. And the beauty of this is that if we instantaneously have to kick your traffic away from data center A to data center B, and it really doesn't take too much more effort for me to do that than what I just did, um, then all we, can be, you know, we can move that without a read-only period. And we, have a, we are certain that all of your data is, re is replicated to a majority of all of the other data centers. If we missed it for, uh, for whatever reason, there's this missed write replication happening in the background. It's moving the data back. It'll keep all of them up to date eventually. And if you have an outage, unplanned or planned, then we can instantaneously shift the traffic over. And note that we're not trying to do backup reads uh, from, the other, from, the, from the offline data center. And the missed write replication is now active. So we're queuing up these things once A comes back online, whether it's after scheduled maintenance or we've drained traffic away in an emergency or whatever, or the network is disconnected. Whatever has happened, we're ready to handle it when, the when that data center comes back online. Um, and even like cleaner, this isolates us from problems in the underlying storage stack, which is to say that if uh, you're serving your application out of A, um, and something, gets, something happens, I mean, hiccups in that stack. Again, remember, we don't run it. We share it with other people. And we attempt to isolate it, but isolation is really hard. So you know, if something happens, if it's some amount of traffic, some amount of disruption, some bug, something's going on that, uh, that disrupts this, uh, uh, this, this, this situation, um, the megastore layer that, that handles all the writes down to the data store uh, can look at that and say, you know what, I'm not actually getting a quick response to the reads and the writes out of my local data store. I prefer that one because it's local. I don't have to go to another data center. But if that one's not performing adequately for me, I'm going to ignore it. And I'm going to, write, I'm going to commit my writes over there to the other data centers, which are, you know, even though I'm sending it over the network and there's a speed of light issue with how fast it gets there and how fast it gets back, it's still better than waiting several seconds for the local storage option to return. And this, this is, goes on the minute that there's any performance problems. You know, I don't even, you know, we, we are aware of what that happened, we, and we monitor it, but I don't have to do anything. The system handles this for me in the middle of the night, you know, right now at Google I.O., and it handles it faster than I can react. Uh, so we see that, you know, that this is perennial uh, theme throughout, uh, through, you know, through, through, throughout all of this, is that, you know, if, if you think about, you know, if you think about modern thinking and systems thinking, you need to expect the unexpected. And, you know, this is really what, this is really what SRE uh, tries to do. Oh, right, there's a story I want to tell you, but all right, so I'll, I'll back up to that. Um, uh, I, I thought about the, I think it, I heard that big table story. And again, that wasn't something that happened to me about the spontaneously deleted big table. And, and I, I, I thought about that, and, and, and my relatives will sometimes say to me, so what exactly is it that you do all day? And um, I thought about that story and sort of how to explain it to them. And, you know, how, how would I explain that? Um, there's a large system. You can think of it sort of like a steam engine. And I understand most of the, you know, it's very elaborate. It's stories tall. I understand most of it. Um, you know, some parts of it are fuzzy around the edge unless I get close to it. Um, and we're working, around, we're working on it, trying to keep it working. And some days, gremlins just pop out of the system and do something really unexpected. And, you know, you chase them off and you get rid of them. And, okay, I'm not likely to see that exact gremlin again, but maybe he's got a cousin. And I should make sure that he and his cousin can't come back again. And 
it's uh, every day. It's every day. It's a every day. It's a new surprise. Um, so how do you survive life in production? And here we see uh, you know our SRE mascot fulfilling its intended purpose in life. Uh, so I talked. To, I made a, a couple points to you earlier on, which is to say, we take these things as given. A service running in a given data center can be no more reliable than the least reliable component it utilizes. But we love, you know, the SRE teams who run the infrastructure under us, but they have outages too, and we need to be. And you know, they're they're conforming to the SLAs that they promised us, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be an outage. Um, and also that you can rely on serving your application at a data center but you have to handle both scheduled maintenance and surprises that will make it unusable at any time. So if you're designing a system uh, to make, uh, you know, to, to, if you're designing something like Google, what are the design principles that you need? Um, and I'm, you know, so, so everybody get ready to take notes. I'm gonna give you away all of Google's secrets. Um, so here's, what, here's what, we, the, what we have found is the best uh, option if you want to build a worldwide reliable set of applications. Um, put the application in multiple data centers. You know, basic, but many people get this wrong. Um, your data centers have to be distributed. They can't be behind the same power. They can't be behind the same network. They can't be on the same floodplain. They can't be on the same fault line. It doesn't matter if you have 100 data centers. If they're behind shared infrastructure like that, they're all going to go offline at once. Um, be capable of absorbing more than one failure at a time. Having two is not enough. Because you'll say, well, I'm serving out of here, and then I'll, oh, I'm having problems. Let me move my traffic over here. Certainly nothing is going to happen to your, this data center over here before you get data, the first data center back online, right? So you know, be capable of absorbing more than one failure at a time, because the law of perversity will make sure that it'll happen to you. Um, write synchronously. Don't write asynchronously. You'll say, OK, well, I can get better performance out of it, and it won't be so bad, and my users will get used to it, and I'll, I'll, I'll find ways around it. We wanted that to be the case. It doesn't actually work. There's a, there's a ceiling to the threshold of reliability that we can offer. We talked about App Engine coming out of uh, Preview and how we're now going to have an SLA for all paid users. That SLA only applies to high replication, to apps using the high replication data store configuration. There's a very specific reason for that. There's only so much reliability we can give you given the asynchronous replication. We try really hard and like, we're spending a lot of our time you know, always trying to improve these things, but there's only so much we can do. Empower the infrastructure. Don't say, uh, you know, don't make it only manual intervention that changes something. Let the megastore layer, you know, or the writing layer, make some, uh, make some interesting decisions about uh, when to, when to like, abandon, you know, writing to the local one and write somewhere else. Don't have that be permanent. Like I said, don't make permanently dangerous decisions based on anything. Um, and when there is a problem, you know, give me, the hand, give me the switch that I can throw that says, move this traffic from here to here as quickly as possible so that I can get I can return your application to service, and we can all stand around the problem and go, huh, we weren't expecting that to happen. Um, and also, if you're trying to build all of this, you know, a bunch of SREs really doesn't hurt who've like, but, you know, done, done, done all these things. So this is a lot of complexity, and it's really, you know, we've, we've talked to people who talk about the private cloud, and it's kind of difficult, unfortunately, to do all of these things on a small scale. The efficiencies only come when you're doing them on a large scale. And they're really difficult and they're really complicated. There are unending piles of bugs that I could tell you about that we found while we were debugging our implementation. And we have incredibly smart people anticipating almost all of these things, and yet still we had a lot of problems. So if you're interested in building an application that is you know, scalable and globally reliable and, you know, and, and not, a, you know, not a manual pain in the ass to administer and fail over, you know, so these are about the things you have to do. Or, well, we think we have a better option. Uh, and as uh, people like to say, it's available right now. Um, and in fact, more than being available right now, it's the default. As of App Engine 1.5.0, we have said high replication is the default. You have to manually make a choice if you want master slave. We don't want you to do that. We are cutting the prices on master slave. Um, you know, on master slave data. Store, I'm sorry, cutting the prices on high replication. Uh, cutting the prices on high replication data store storage costs to encourage people. There are already migration processes that we have to move your existing apps from master slave to high replication. Um, we are working on improving those. That's one of our very top priorities, and we expect to have something about that out very shortly, probably you know, on the order of you know, weeks, not months. You know, we want you to move your applications over. And so if you, I mean, 
we really believe in, in this. And we, we, I, I hope that you've, you've taken away from this. This is all of the stuff that we learned about our, about you know, implementing applications on top of Google's infrastructure. And the stuff that we, that we, set, we, we experienced taught us what we needed to do to make things better. And we think it works fine if your application is just starting out. Um, if you've, you know, if you've just, it's, a, it's a great platform to design to if you've got you know, the next great idea that you want to build and monetize. Or if you've already got a tremendous amount of traffic and you want a better scaling story than, well, I guess it's time to uh, you know, send somebody out to the store to buy a bunch more machines and put them in the data center. Uh, you know, and the, the beauty of this system is, again, the dynamic scaling. Right? If you get mentioned on Oprah in the middle of the night when you're sleeping, and all of a sudden everybody in the world wants to go to your website, or you know, Justin Bieber Twitters about it, or whatever it is the kids do these days, um, then, uh, you know, then the App Engine will allow you to scale this automatically. Like, we'll, you know, it, you'll be ready for whatever traffic, and all that will happen is we'll hand you a slightly higher bill that month. And you know, you know, I you know, hope you got that monetized properly. You know, very enthusiastic about that. Um, and with that comes an army of us, right? We've got, uh, we are com we've got uh, developer support people. We've got forums that you can interact with. Uh, coming out of preview, we've got paid support options that are, um, you know, we've got paid support options for incidents and for, uh, uh, you know, ticket responses that you, know, that you can take advantage of if you need this. We're taking this, you know, we're, we're taking the availability of this very seriously. And you get me and my team. We're follow the sun on call coverage. I don't get woken up in the middle of the night by pages. I've got people in other time zones so that you know, we can all be really fresh when we're working on these problems, right? It's not crisis, it's not crisis for us. And we'll take our, all of that stuff that I mentioned, we'll take care of it for you. Like this is, I like that kind of stuff. This is, I, I, I mean, I, get, I'm, I wake up and I go, well, something's, something weird is gonna happen to me today most likely and it'll probably be pretty exciting. And I, I accept that there's probably something wrong with me and my team, that like, there's, there's, like, there's something wrong with us. Uh, but you know, if, if you don't want to have to do it, we'll take care of it for you. Because uh, you, know, you can focus on, on what you're excited about, your domain knowledge, your application. Um, on the other hand, if that kind of stuff does excite you, I am bound by contract to say, we are hiring for SRE all over the globe, many projects, many, uh, uh, many, many facilities, many, uh, Many data centers, uh, data centers, many offices, and we, you know, there are so many things that we could teach you. So if, it, if that interests you, please come talk to me. Um, so I'm folding up uh, what I've got to say here, and I'm going to take a moment and get uh, get very serious. Uh, and so we need to talk a little bit about transparency. And I don't need to tell you all that uh, cloud computing is big business. You know, it's uh, it's not you know just some website or you know people can you know dismiss it all they want but out there in the customer area we've got web filings and they're taking fortune 100 companies their sec data and getting their quarterly filings into the sec on time with them that's real money real jail time for people for non-compliance right congressional investigations etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, we hosted the website for the recent royal wedding right this is you know once in a lifetime or well maybe twice when uh when uh, uh, harry gets married but whatever um you know, so the, the, uh, the you know, the, a once in a, you know, a, a unique event uh, that will, you know, on TV, every, all eyes on it. And when Accenture said, we need a, an infrastructure to host it, they said, App Engine. You know, so this, there's a lot of money coming into this. And we know that we have to treat this very seriously, as seriously as you treat your users. When we have problems, you need to know about it as quickly as possible. You need to understand what we're doing to make the App Engine more reliable, that we're working on it, you know, very seriously, and we've got the architectural choices that we've made, the improvements that we're working on. Um, when we start having a problem, you need to know about it as quickly as possible. And so, like I said, we've got the communication, we've got all of these things, SLA for uh, paid apps on our application once we come out of preview. All of this is saying, we are going to tell you what's going on. When we have problems, we'll give you a detailed postmortem. You know, we're, you know, we're bringing out the SREs to give talks when I don't have any features to tell you other than you should use HRD and, you know, here's some hilarious stories. Um, so the other story about transparency that's important uh, is that you need to know when you're having problems before your users know that you're having problems. And those problems aren't necessarily all connected to App Engine's infrastructure. They could also be related to high load that your application is experiencing or a new piece of code. And uh, the story for monitoring App Engine applications hasn't historically been great. It's, it's, it's true for most cloud applications, honestly. And this is something that we know that we need to improve if you're going to actually 
you know, if you're going to trust us to say we're as available as we are and give us your money and give us your trust, give us your data. So, app, uh, so Alan Green, uh, an engineer out of the SRE engineer out of the Sydney office, has been working on improving uh, the monitoring story for App Engine applications. And I'm going to turn this over to him so that he can tell you all about what he's been working on. Well done. Hi. So um, Michael's been telling you about how Google looks after the App Engine platform. Um, and a key part of that is our monitoring tools. Um, so for App Engine, we're monitoring thousands and thousands of statistics about all of the components that make up App Engine. Um, and we're able to spot problems and hopefully find and fix them before your apps even notice. So I'm going to cover the uh, monitoring API um, that is going into Trusted Tester today. I guess the question is, why do you need to monitor your apps? If there's this team of Google SREs looking after the platform, and if uh, you're confident in their ability um, to, uh, to keep the platform running, why do you even need to monitor your own apps? The answer is, like, for many simple apps, um, you don't need to monitor them. They're so simple, and they use such a small fraction of App Engine's capabilities that as long as the platform is stable, they're going to keep running. But for more complex apps, the kinds of apps that a business might depend upon for critical functions, um, there's some reasons why you might monitor. Um, so first, the reason is it gives you insight into the, the running of the platform. So say data store latency increases slightly um, and starts to get to the point where it's affecting your customers. It would be good to know that before your customers start to call you. Uh, another reason is so that you can get insight into your own application. Uh, and a good example of that is mail quotas. So if your app is sending mail, you set a budget for it, and App Engine lets you send mail up until you hit that budget. Uh, but if you're getting close to that budget, it would be good to know, because when you hit it, it stops. Um, and if you know, you can do something about it in advance. Uh, and finally, um, it, you need to monitor because you're on the internet um, and every crazy person with a computer can see your app. So um, Michael mentioned before uh, Gripe, G-R-I.pe, who were mentioned on Oprah, and their traffic graph kind of was going along flat at uh, just a couple of requests per second, and within a few minutes, they're all of a sudden uh, serving 250 requests per second. And It'd be good to know when something like that happens to your app, right? Um, so how many people here actually use a monitoring tool in their organization? A few of you, right, so you'll know all this. But a, a monitoring tool uh, is a program that sits there and it polls the things that it monitors. Um, they can be anything from hardware devices to, to databases to servers, your own software. Um, but the important thing is that um, when something goes wrong, it tells you about it um, and lets you look at the history of what's happened to the service. So there's uh, quite a number of different monitoring tools, but uh, three of the big ones out there are Nagios, uh, Zabbix, and HP OpenView. You might have heard those names before. What this API does is lets you uh, integrate uh, your App Engine app into the monitoring tool um, so that you can see it the same way you see everything else in your service. Uh, so diving down a little bit more into the API, here are the things you need to know about it. It's experimental. We're putting this out there so that we can get some feedback about whether we're providing the right information about your apps to you, uh, whether we're providing it in a good form. Um, it's, the information that it exposes is uh, all the stuff that's currently on the dashboard. So um, let me just flick over and have a look at this app's dashboard. Yeah, so um, the number of requests per second coming in, uh, all this good stuff. How many instances you're currently running, how much memory you're currently using, all of that now comes out through the monitoring API, uh, as well as uh, all of the quota information that's, that's on the dashboard. Oh, so the, because it's a standard API, You can use uh, the Google API Explorer to, um, to get, uh, <laughs> you can use the Google API Explorer to, to investigate the API. So there's two methods we're providing. One is uh, 
apps.list to list all of the applications that you have. Um, and it's all secured, so let's try to execute this. We see the results down here. Oh, we need to be authenticated, we must have. And there we go. These are all of the applications that this user is allowed to see, um, that this user is an ad administrator of. Um, so let's just take one of these. And uh, look at the counters. We call them counters, um, but it's just the statistics. The reason for that is the most interesting ones are usually just simple counters. So, and then the results come back. Um, lovely JSON list. Actually, we could skip down to an interesting one here. Um, how many memcache calls have been made? Uh, and today, this app's done 486,274 so far. Um, so that's the form of the API, just two calls. Great. Um, if you're programming to it, here's an example in Python. Um, typical Google API. So you get your credentials. Uh, you go and ask for details about the service. In this, uh, in this case, uh, App Engine Monitoring version alpha one. Um, and then you can do things with the API. So uh, list all of the apps and then list all the counters. Uh, OK, so that's the API. Very simple. Uh, let's dive into an example. Um, I built an app here. Um, this is why they don't let SREs write user-facing code. Uh, there are, um, so very simple app. There's three URLs. There's um, slash here, which is the home URL. Um, you can write some more news, um, or you can view news in a way that allows you to page through. And that just takes a little OK, so let's say you've got all of this monitoring integrated. Everything's happy. Um, it's serving away. Um, and then one night, your pager actually goes off. And it says, um, excuse me, there's a lot of CPU usage all of a sudden. Um, so you jump into Zabbix, and you have a look at the graphs. Um, this red line here is the alerting level. So if CPU usage goes over this line for uh, more than a few samples, it will, um, it will sound an alert. Um, and you can see here that. CPU usage was pegging along at like under 1,000 megacycles per minute, uh, per second for uh, quite a long time. And then all of a sudden, it's uh, jumped up, and it's now using 33,000 uh, megacycles per second, uh, which is a lot of CPUs. Um, so when something like this goes wrong, um, and CPU usage spikes like this, then either something's changed in the code, or you're getting like, some different stimulus to the application. Um, and so the next graph you might want to look at then is how much traffic are we getting on each of the different paths coming in to the application. So this red line here is uh, requests to the, the home page. And you can see they're pegging along pretty consistently at 11 or 12 requests per second. But then just lately, we've started getting requests in for slash news which is different. So that's a bit suspicious. Um, then we can dive down uh, and have a look at, underneath the application, what API calls it's making. Uh, this graph is showing the number of calls per second to the data store in the green line and to memcache in the, the purple line there. And memcache, you know, it's a bit spiky, but you know, generally doing somewhere between 10 and 20 calls per second. That's all good. And the data store is doing very few calls until just recently. So that looks like it might, might be the problem. Um, and so let's put together what we've discovered through the monitoring API so far. We've got um, a massive increase in CPU, uh, massive increase in data store usage, no increase in memcache usage, and a little bit of extra traffic coming in on one path. Um, that would suggest to me that um, one, that one path that's serving a tiny little bit of traffic is serving it uncached, but instead going straight to the data store and doing so, something very complex 
and not actually, uh, not actually caching the result. Uh, and in fact, because I wrote this dodgy app, I know that's exactly what's happening. Um, possible solutions here is find what it is that's sending traffic to your app um, and modify your code to um, properly use memcache for that URL. Um, right, so that's um, pretty much the monitoring API, what it is and how to use it. It exposes dashboard stats. Uh, it's compatible with pretty much any monitoring tool. They all require a little bit of stitching up to make it all code together. Um, it's powered by App Engine uh, because it turns out that if you want to write at Google, if you want to write a distributed app that works across multiple data centers, um, is highly reliable and available, uh, App Engine's a great way to do that. Um, and we have a trusted tester program for this. Um, if you're uh, monitoring currently or thinking about monitoring and are interested in joining up, um, you can go to this short URL or you can come talk to us after the presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. All right, so we're about to fold it up here, and uh, just so you know, this, just so you know where you were in case you fell asleep, uh, this is Life in App Engine Production, Google I.O. 2011. Uh, I'm Michael Handler. That was Alan Green giving you the extent of the monitoring demo. You can talk about this. Please give us feedback on this. I'd love to see what, see what you thought. Uh, the trusted tester um, API, we're, you know, we're, 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 love, we're definitely enthusiastic about getting people uh, into that program and learning some more about it. Um, there's been some really interesting talks uh, that, unfortunately, you have to go back in time to see them. But I've got a link uh, to one that's incredibly relevant. If you want m even more architectural details of the higher application data store configuration versus the uh, master-slave uh, data store configuration, Alfred Fuller and Matt Wilder, Matt's an, uh, another SRE on my team, uh, they gave a talk earlier today called More Nines, Please, Under the Covers of the High Replication Data Store. And they'll give you, they've got animated diagrams in their PowerPoint. It's fantastic. I thoroughly recommend you watch the video. Um, so we've actually run our, the clock out a little bit. So I'm not going to take any questions here. But uh, Alan and I are going to be waiting outside. We'll take some questions out there. And uh, we might have some of the other App Engine, App Engine uh, developers and SREs around if you wanted to ask questions about production. Thank you so much for coming. And enjoy the rest of I.O.